Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. We're playing Super Mario Brothers at lunch and talking and getting to know each other. And, <laughs> and, um, and this led to like this really, uh, I don't want to say heated, but it was a really great debate and, and discussion that you followed us out of the building into the parking garage and it was like i don't know six o'clock in january and i was like tom you guys haven't made any improvements in two years prove me wrong andrew it's been a while since uh you and i worked together and uh recently we had a chance to catch up and you were telling me um kind of what you're currently working on and the uh the organization that you work for and some of the challenges that you had with your team as well as other teams that are working as part of the delivery pipeline so maybe it would be good just to give the audience uh, a quick overview of uh, uh, you know type of work that you do the the company and uh, maybe a little bit of background on the team that you joined uh, it's been a couple of years now right but uh, yeah. what, what was the situation when you joined the team and uh, maybe just give us a little bit of background on that yeah absolutely um, so Quick introduction. Uh, I'm Andrew Harner. Um, I self-proclaimed agility champion, right? Uh, you know, I try to not uh, pigeonhole myself or, or brand myself into any one uh, framework or methodology, but just try to uh, try to absorb as much uh, as many tools as possible um, that I can use uh, in organizations. So, um, joined Wex back in 2018. Uh, December 2018. Wex is a financial services company um, that has some exposure in the fuel business and healthcare and uh, business to business B2B uh, payment spaces. Um, and Tom so and in layman terms, what do you guys do? Like, what does Wex do? Like, if, if, what type of products and services do you provide and who are your customers? So uh, they're, they're, we're a payments company. Right, so we help facilitate uh, payments in those areas. So think uh, HSA payments, uh, fuel cards, uh, virtual credit cards, um, uh, that that type of stuff. Uh, and Tom and I currently we work on uh, an open loop issuing processor uh, in the B two B two B portion uh, of the company. So uh, I'll pause there and let Tom just do a quick intro before we get into anything else. Great. And uh, yeah, I'm Tom Cashel. I'm a team lead on one of the development teams for that open loop processor, which is called TAG or Transact Global. So what is open yeah. loop processor? What does that really do? Right, so it's like, uh, imagine the credit card that you have in your wallet. Um, mm -hmm. As long as it's not tied to, there's two different kinds of things, right? There's open loop and closed loop. Open loop is typically what the consumer is going to have in their wallet. Like a generic MasterCard, you can use it to pay at any vendor, any merchant location that accepts that card, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to closed loop, which the business and the card and the issuer all need to be in like a a group, a shared, a shared group together, and there's benefits. Uh, for that. So other parts of WEX do closed loop processing, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around like uh, fuel payments, fuel cards and stuff. Um, and, and we do the open loop portion. Okay, awesome. Thank you for kind of giving, I knew a yeah. little bit about it, but I think it'll help uh, uh, the listeners also understand. So Andrew, you joined this company, WEX in 2018, and then what happened? Yeah, so the intent for bringing me on was uh, there were two scrum teams at the time and they were looking to scale up to a third team. Um, mm -hmm. And so they brought me on to be uh, the scrum master for that third team. Um, so joined uh, in 2018, December, before that third team was really formed and spent some, you know, like any good scrum master, spent some time just observing, trying to figure out what was going on, who were the people and trying to build relationships. Um, and through that observation period, I had discovered that there were some some blind spots that they had uh, in their uh, in their operating model, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. The teams at the time were leveraging kind of relative story point estimation and velocity uh, for their uh, sizing and planning activities, um, and that data was being maintained 
in a spreadsheet um, that was reviewed during and discussed during each retrospective. Um, and what I, one of the first things that I, I noticed was kind of um, how this was implemented um, and how, this, how the teams were using these things. So mm -hmm. the work itself, uh, the, the customer request was split uh, in different ways. One of the ways was uh, aligned to skill sets, right? So we had a, a ticket that a developer would work on and we had a ticket um, part of that ticket was, or, or part of the request, we had another ticket for a QA engineer to write the, the test cases for. And then we had another ticket that represented um, the deployment activities, right? The release activities. Mm -hmm. um, so there was some, uh, uh, it wasn't a, a, a holistic view of that work item. It was, it was already kind of split. Um, mm -hmm. And then the, the work itself was only visualized up until a certain point in the value stream, right? And so there was a series of release activities that included uh, a regression cycle and deployment to our production environment. And those activities uh, were not necessarily treated as team activities, they were treated as release activities. And so they weren't, those work centers weren't visualized on the team's board. And so uh, bringing it all back, um, the estimating and planning uh, that took place uh, earlier in the sprint didn't have insights into those portions, right? And so we were, we were estimating and planning to get work up through a certain portion of the value stream, but it wasn't the, con the complete picture. So right? in so a sense, like the your definition of done wasn't really that strong. It was only- It was like a dev complete, some... right? Yeah. It was like a, it was yeah. like a dev complete, right? So we still had, and we still didn't have the final piece of feedback, right? Which was, mm -hmm. does this cause a regression? Will this cause a regression, right? Um, and that activity was performed um, the last two days before the production release. So it didn't really leave us much time uh, to get any fixes that would have been identified in before the scheduled prod release. And so mm -hmm. um, those are some observa early observations. The next uh, piece was, um, so I spent some time um, trying to bring the team together around that. Let's, I, I, I think it was the second or third month that I was there. I, I convinced enough people to, to come together for a value stream mapping session. So we sat down over uh, a little one hour sessions over a couple of weeks, um, mm -hmm. pulling all the people together that, that had a piece in that full process. And we, we had mapped it out um, uh, on, on a virtual whiteboard. And it was really interesting conversations that took place. I remember Tom, I was asking uh, our, our QA manager at the time, um, hey, when, how often are you finding bugs or finding defects when code makes it to this portion of the value stream? And she said, 99% of the time we get, we get bugs. And I'm like, so this has a, you know, the development, <laughs> the development work center has a 1% complete and accurate in there. And she's like, well, yeah. And Tom's face was like, oh man, that is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was the conversation that, that surrounded those were, were really uh, powerful, right? It was the first time I think that the team had come together to see all the steps that it would take to get, you know, a request out the door. It wasn't just, I'm focused on my piece. It, mm -hmm. it really painted that full picture. Um, and so once I, as a, as a newcomer had that full picture, I started to, to collect some uh, data um, in a very manual way of work mm -hmm. moving throughout the, the, the pipeline or the value stream. Um, and as I analyzed that and kind of, went historically went backwards and tried to collect some stuff uh, from from previous sprints previous iterations I'd realized that the team really hadn't made any significant improvements to their delivery capabilities in two years right mm -hmm. and um, how did it feel little... to, to how to feel like to be probably the only person that understood that because I'm assuming most of the organization was blind to that yeah I it or at was least strange, within the right? team yeah <laughs> right. I, I had, you know, this, we're, we're months into this now. And so I, I, you know, having conversations throughout these times and I could, I get this feeling like I'm thinking a little bit differently than other people are thinking in the, in the organization. And that was some, some people reacted really well to that. And, and, you know, and those were great. And other, others were, you know, a little bit curious and like, uh, they, yeah. they, you know, uh, questioning and, and which is great. Right. But, um, those conversations were a little, I had, I had, yeah try to be a little delicate in them. And sometimes I was uh, <laughs> successful or, or not in those, 
those times. But um, yeah, so that led to this realization and like, what do I do with this information now, right? And so enter Tom, stage left uh, or stage right. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, um, Tom and I had been having, I had been trying to build a relationship with Tom. Uh, I saw him as a, as a great friend uh, personally, but also he was a really re well-respected professionally ac across the team. And so as I'm building this relationship, we're playing Super Mario Brothers at lunch and talking and getting to know each other. And, and, um, and this led to like this really, uh, I don't want to say heated, but it was a really great debate and, and discussion that you followed us out of the building into the parking garage. And it was like, I don't know, six o'clock in January. And I was like, Tom, you guys haven't made any improvements in two years. Prove me wrong. And uh, so he spent that next weekend trying to prove me wrong. Yeah. So um, unlike Harner, I didn't come from a background uh, where I would ask a lot of those questions, right? So I was, I came up in that traditional like agile scrum methodology where, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like I'd been on some good teams and some unsuccessful teams in the past. And, and so I, I had a really good handle on it and I knew where I was going. And so at this point in my life, I was, King velocity. I was, you know, talking about story points, estimates. I thought I had it all, uh, all wrapped up. And so we get into the parking garage, and Harner challenges me with this. By and the way, this is this is January in Maine. Yeah, and you guys yeah. are standing oh, it in was a parking garage, un unheated, <laughs> freezing cold. Like we're using the concrete blocks of the wall to like show how work items are moving. I mean, the conversation <laughs> went everywhere but when he said when when andrew said you know prove me wrong prove that show me what substantive changes you've made to your, what concrete changes you've made to your delivery process like i i listed off a handful right off the bat right and he's like well how did that improve how did that improve things like show me so I went back home and my wife, you know, was at work the next day. This is Saturday, right? So I've got the I've got the kids to myself, like working through all that. And I'm like thinking over it in my head, like, man, I'm gonna show this guy what's up. So <laughs> so I pull out my laptop, like I get all the kids huddled together around uh around the counter and we're eating our food at the counter, which is a big deal for them, right? Because they always eat at the dining room table. But I'm like sitting there with my laptop, <laughs> like trying to play with these numbers and stuff and like fend off the kids. And like I'm pulling all the stuff out of our ticket system, I'm pulling all of the the like timing information I can, get it all into a spreadsheet get some spreadsheet magic, like learning spreadsheets at the same time too. And like, mm -hmm. finally, um, I get something together that I share with with Harner, like around two o'clock in the afternoon. And we probably spend the rest of the day going back and forth. And we get a pretty primitive now um, realization of lead times, uh, throughput, some work in progress uh, statistics, all kind of carved out on this really, really choppy spreadsheet. And it turns out that Harner was correct. Our delivery <laughs> capabilities, like, so I spent 12 hours proving myself wrong, right? Um, but yeah, our delivery capabilities over the past two and a half, I think it was at the time, uh, years of working on the project had not meaningfully improved at all. In fact, the only time that we saw like a throughput increase, which is what we we're traditionally worried about with the number of stories we got done, mm -hmm. um, the number of story points we got done, the only time we even saw that was right, you know, a month or two after we hired a new person. <laughs> so that was like the only way in which we improved that delivery trajectory was was hiring. Um, Just add more people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like all of us know that that's, you know, not the way it's supposed to be in the industry. The mythical man month is a pretty seminal text and stuff. So mm -hmm. at that point I was like, okay, there might be something to what Harner's talking about here. Yeah. And then what, what happened? So you got, at least you got one other person, Andrew, to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, so then, you know, uh, Tom and I kind of set out in this mission to um, help align the, the rest of the folks that we were working with, trying to help um, guide them towards this realization as well. And so the first step was to take that work that we had done 
um, with or that I had done with the, the value stream mapping and tried mm -hmm. to reflect that and visualize that for the, the application. And, you know, we're lucky enough uh, to work at a company that we have tooling that supports that, right? Um, some, some folks use manual things like stickies on a board, which is great. Um, but you know, we, we have a technology that supports that. So we could uh, put that in there and, and then have that help kind of facilitate some automation of collecting this data for us. Um, and so that value stream mapping session um, that I had led to us kind of um, rethinking how we're visualizing our work in JIRA, right? So each of our columns now represented the, our, our work centers and we had uh, a pretty high level, but, but um, solid understanding of all the tasks that are being performed in each of these work centers, right? And, mm -hmm. and what, it, what is the exit criteria? What does it mean when we move a ticket from this state to this state? And, and, um, and that alignment led us to having this data that Tom spent hours and hours and hours and I had spent months trying to kind of uh, curate manually. We had it available mm -hmm. to us, you know, in real time, updated in real time for us. Um, that was hooked in uh, through a, 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 an add-on um, called Nave. So Nave kind of allows us to pull that those flow value stream metrics out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but one of the biggest changes that the team made was the um, extending the the visualization from Dev Complete all the way to Done. Right. So we brought those release capabilities, those release activities, onto the board to have it visualized so that we can make that work visible. Um, right. And and the reason why we decided to do that, right, was because in the course of that 12 hour crunch time on on Saturday, uh, yeah. where we had that spreadsheet together, we realized that the two teams were defining those things slightly differently. So like the data integrity was only like on a per team basis. And, and my team in particular wasn't capturing that full the rest of the things after it was dev complete. So we mm -hmm. wanted to get to alignment uh, for for everybody that was participating in our value stream about like all of the things that any given work item went through. So, so that was happened, like the first uh, thing. Yeah. So what happened? Like in a sense, you said like when it was dev, dev complete. Uh, what were you deploying it? Just not visualizing what was going on. Like yeah. so, why weren't you? Interesting call out, right? So, um, the what is the responsibilities of this our teams, right? Some. Um, some teams they have handoffs, right? Some teams, other teams are responsible for that that regression or integration testing and system testing and, and release. But in tags context, uh, the team owned all of that stuff. We own the the complete ecosystem of of our you know our SDLC, right? So mm -hmm. from the identification and prioritization of work all the way through that work hitting production is is our activities that are performed within our teams, um, and so. Uh, we uh, we just brought that and, and visualized the team's full process onto the board. Um, so previously, because the release activities uh, were treated not as team activities, even though it was performed by the team, um, they were left off the board. But so we, we try to get the team to realize, that, hey, it's still work that you're doing. The work is not done yet, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so instead of having uh, work pile up, in a ready for regression testing and, and that being kind of done, um, we wanted to have that buffer or that wait state visualized as well as the time it was taking to get through regression and then waiting for the production release and then finally moving to done. So mm -hmm. uh, the old board, dev complete meant uh, we've done our, our coding, we've done our you know, functional acceptance testing, and now we're just going to be waiting for the regression cycle to begin, which could be mm -hmm. uh, the following day. But if, you know, if that was completed the first day of the sprint, it could be, you know, six days from now, seven days from now. Mm -hmm. So so how do you get the team members involved, right? Like in a sense, none of this can happen if, uh, you know, Andrew and Tom are <laughs> champions, I'm assuming, and based on, you know, just small things that I picked up, uh, from earlier conversation as well as this, you had to get your team members involved. So how yeah. did that go? It was very iterative. Um, yeah. Have you ever seen that video of there's, I don't remember what festival it was, but there's this guy that's dancing by himself on a hill. We're very, very <laughs> fond I of that, that video. I use that a video a lot. In the, yeah. Uh, we're, we're very fond of that because 
like in that video if, if yeah. you are the audience or whatever is familiar with um with it there's this second guy that comes in we call him the green shirt guy right because he's wearing a green shirt and he comes in and he starts dancing with the dude and then like not very long after that the entire hill is just a bunch of dancing people having fun right what, I thought you were gonna Har- say you get you gave some kind of drugs to you. Like that, so <laughs> <laughs> that may uh, have but, been easier uh, if it, we had a. But you're that. talking about the second follower, uh, right? Uh, and so, concert, so, yeah. right, yeah. So that that like we finally refer to that guy as or me as the green shirt guy, right? Because uh-huh. like once <laughs> I come in, I'm like like. I proved myself wrong, so now I'm like, well, I want to do it the right way. I want to, I want to find some improvement here. Mm-hmm. So after we get everybody aligned, we brought in um, other scrum masters and and like one or two members of the leadership team at first. Once mm-hmm. we said, hey, we want to align on measuring this stuff. We want to start capturing the full value stream in a uniform way. And everyone was like, well, okay, that's not that big of a lift for us, right? Mm-hmm. Like because of what Harner was just talking about, we already owned all those capabilities on the team. It's just basically reorganizing what we decide to call things and making sure that's standardized across like everyone. Mm -hmm. And so that was a pretty easy lift. So we got somebody to say yes to that, right? Like it was fine, everybody got on board. And then we let it sit for a while, honestly. We we started just capturing the data. We cleaned up the data and we started capturing Mm -hmm. it. We got the teams familiar with like the new definitions, the simple definitions of things um, so that we could start getting uh, some insight into the system. And then we waited about a month or two and we looked at our tool and to see what the data was telling us. And Mm -hmm. it was frankly uh, pretty astonishing at first. Um, right. We we started running an experiment uh, based off that, which I'll let Harner talk about. With uh, yeah. well, maybe just to pause I wanna... here, I, I just want to I, I want to bring attention to something that I think there's a misconception out there. So people joke around um, with you know how Jira has become you know agile, like or it's the most popular scaling, right? And I think it's important to to point out like just for you how the tool Jira and these other tools were really to help you uh, have you know uh, quality data and, and to paint a picture, and uh, in a way like you know right or wrong, you used you use the tool in a way that actually helped you mm. understand what was going on. So do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Cause I think you are both probably familiar with what I'm talking about, yeah. you know, how people joke around, That's, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the use of Jira and uh, or any gonna, for that That's where I was gonna call out next too, is, is yeah. a lot of times um, the inverse of what we did is true where in the inverse being, um, teams change their process to fit JIRA. And, and so, they, they, they do it, uh, you know, they read that you should implement JIRA this way and, 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 and you, uh, you know, kind of conform to it. Um, and what we wanted to be very clear was that I don't want to change anything about how the team is working, right? There, there is a, an existing value stream, right? It is what it mm-hmm. is. Um, and, and the teams are operating in that already. I just wanted to be able to have Jira reflect that, reflect what reality was for them. And so mm-hmm. Tom mentioned the kind of standardization or definitions. Those, those things weren't, they already existed. They just weren't explicit. And so Jira helped to, to surface those and make them visible to everybody, right? And mm-hmm. so, you know, work kind of naturally traverses this process um, already and uh, bring that, that forward. So, so it really helped to, to um, enhance or amplify our abilities um, to, to measure uh, our delivery capabilities, the, the things that already mm-hmm. existed, right? We didn't have to make any changes. We did change, but uh, we changed the way we visualized it, not the way that we actually worked. Um, yeah, yeah. And that was the key thing for us is we um, getting everybody aligned. Hey, we all agree, you know, take Jira out of it. We all agree that this is what, how work flows through. And mm-hmm. these are the types of work that we do now. If we are aligned on that, why don't we have Jira reflect those things so that we can use it to capture um, the data that we want? Um, and mm-hmm. so that was the easy sell that Tom um, said. It was it was fairly easy to, to get the teams to agree to that. So what happened when they started seeing that? Like, it, I'm assuming 
it, it, it's it's motivating right to see this yeah. stuff and to to like and it's also probably exciting for you <laughs> now right. you get that whole uh, uh yeah. hill dancing you know and uh, it's right. a party right <laughs> yeah they weren't uh yeah they, there wasn't a whole lot of dancing at first right so tom yeah. you know he alluded we uh we observed for a while right so we we put yeah. the hooks in we set this up we put the hooks in and then we just uh kind of backed off for a while i think it was it wasn't a month i think it was closer to uh six to nine months that, that we kind of stepped back and just let the data start rolling in. And, mm -hmm. uh, and finally, I, I think I'd almost forgotten, <laughs> forgotten about it for a bit. And, and then I, I, I pinged Tom, I said, Hey, we, we should, we got like nine months of data now. Let's go out there and check it and see what's going on. And so at mm -hmm. that point, uh, it was, it, it reignited a, a flame that it was like, wow, this is really powerful. We could, we have all these different lenses that we can look through kind of our, our work, you know, um, and, we, we, it became very clear to us where our constraint was. It was like night and day, but there was no question that, that this is the area. Mm -hmm. And this is why we hadn't seen any improvements in two years because none could of our you efforts maybe, were- could, could you talk about some of those specific examples? Like what was like, oh, holy shit. You know, this is like, you know, when everybody sees this, you know, people will freak out, right? Like, well, uh, there was the, the very first thing we noticed is that there was this weird pattern we were seeing uh, every couple of months where work would just sort of all of a sudden come in in a huge batch, right? And we'd be working on a ton of stuff. And mm -hmm. anecdotally at that time, right? Like the first time we started looking at the data, uh, um, my team was also starting to uh, complain about and grumble about the number of things we had going on at once. And we made like internal agreements about like limiting that right like at that point nobody was really talking about the data nobody was talking about the concept of like whip limits specifically um to solve mm -hmm. that problem it was all just sort of like hey we're really scattered we need to focus up a little bit and so we go you know herner and i go look at the data and we see this giant spike in in work in progress and um at that point that's when herner reached out to his team uh to talk about the data and and try to run an experiment yeah, so we, uh, I brought this up and I, I, I showed him some of the, the um, little charts and graphs and, and I said, and every time we saw this spike in work in progress, we also saw a corresponding spike in, in cycle time, right? So everything mm -hmm. kind of, it, we had these massive kind of um, tidal waves of sorts of, of work coming in and taking longer and then we purge. And then work comes in and we mm -hmm. take longer to purge. And I said, you know, every time we, ha like, every time we have less, Work going on; those things are getting done uh, in in a in the time that they should be they should take. They weren't inflated, um, mm -hmm. they weren't you know bloated. And so I said, hey, let's run an experiment off this data, right? This was back in July. And I said, starting in August, let's implement and enforce some some strict whip limits. And the team agreed. And then, and then the conversation was, you know, where do we start? What is an, an appropriate whip limit? And um, you know, there isn't necessarily the uh, uh, the right place to start, but it's just we, mm -hmm. we let's choose some place and go from there. And but we look, we use the data to to make that, and and so we saw that the team, um, uh, it was seven seven items was like kind of below where the team had normally been fluctuating. I think they were fluctuating anywhere from like twelve to eight, right, at mm -hmm. any given time. And so let's we said let's exploit this. Let's let's run this experiment of, of limiting to seven. And so we did that, and uh, and then we sat back and, and watched for the next uh, six weeks or something like that. And man, those tidal waves were gone. It was just they were just ripples at that point. And so um, you know that was the only change we made. We didn't make any change to how we refined our work, how we broke the stories apart. We didn't, we didn't make any changes to how we developed or worked, you know, as pairs or it was nothing. That was the only change. Yeah. And it was just, just a, a dramatic. Did you guys notice any, because uh, usually when you create constraints like web, right? Usually it forces people like, hey, I'm now a developer, I need to test. Or well, did you guys experience any of that? Like what happened in that? Yeah, absolutely. So that that definitely triggered some conversations um, about uh, those who's responsible for certain things. And so we started to mm -hmm. see more partnership take place with uh, between dev and QA, right? Because mm -hmm. um, if, if somebody from, you know, some if a test engineer was out on vacation, right? And, and now we went from two test engineers to one, right? Mm -hmm. One of the devs would have to come up and, and help 
kind of uh, take over some of those testing responsibilities. Um, so we saw that kind of wall, and which is an interesting um, thing because, right, we have a team of, we have developers, QA engineers and operations engineers on a team, but yet there's still like these micro silos within the team of like handoffs. Mm -hmm. And so we start to see those kind of artificial walls being pulled down, which is really, really cool as a result of that. Whip and that was all natural. Did you guys uh, actually kind of nudge them or did that happen just by, by itself? I think it happened pretty naturally um, yeah. because it was now all the work was visualized, right? Everybody could see mm -hmm. it every morning. I have, have mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, we've got work filing up in front of QA. I mean, and, and um, you know, so-and-so is, is a, about to hit the, uh, the limit here. So let's, yeah. let's lend a hand, helping hand. Right. As, as I'm, uh, it's just, it's interesting. Maybe just like, it's almost like a lot of times what I see scrum masters and change agents, like, you know, kind of uh, not, I mean, nudge is a good word. It's more like tell people what to do or tell team members. Right. And this is almost like you're putting a mirror using the data, putting a mirror to the mm -hmm. team and not even not telling just here, here's what it is. Right. And them self-organize. And I, I think that's uh that that's what i've seen naturally and like what i've seen stick when it works and when it doesn't it's usually somebody enforcing these things or telling mm -hmm. people and uh it's easier to do that when you've seen it you know you, you just want to jump and tell team what to do but i also know what, what ha like apparently what transpired there with your teams is what is going to give you better results long term when people actually buy Right. And, and we never really talked about that beforehand. I think mm -hmm. Harner and I just sort of assumed that that's the way we wanted to do this, right? We, we wanted to look at the data and we wanted to see what the data was telling us. And any problems or challenges we came up with as a result of those conversations, mm -hmm. we wouldn't try to source the, the solution amongst mm -hmm. ourselves. We would just mm -hmm. raise the problem. We'd say, we'd bring it to the team. We'd say, hey, we have this massive tidal wave of work in progress every two months. What do you guys mm -hmm. want to do about it? Hey, we have this other problem. What do you guys want to do about it? And and every time without fail, as we've started to take on these experiments mm -hmm. and refine them and then reflect back on the results of those things with the team, we've seen the improvement and we've kind of gotten the team more and more involved in the process. And I think you're right. I think it's really Again, I don't have much experience outside of this team with doing that, but it's mm -hmm. it's a very powerful motivator putting putting the data and the problem in front of the team and saying, mm -hmm. how do we fix this? Here are some mm -hmm. suggestions we have from our experience or whatever, but how do you guys want to do this? And then, you know, come back to it and see if we we're successful or not. Exactly. Yeah. So after we did the whip limit experiment, Right, that was kind of the second time we got somebody to say yes, right? Somebody to kind of get bought in uh, yeah. a little bit more, get our hooks a little bit more into, into everybody. And mm -hmm. at, at this point too, like Harner and I were meeting pretty much every day to learn about the data, to figure out what new we wanted to, to pull in, to ask mm -hmm. more questions, right? Because at that time we were really only looking at lead times. And so we started- Every, ask every day. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, what is this telling us? What is this yeah. telling us? We didn't even know how to read some of the charts, right? Like uh -huh. it, it was kind of crazy. But and then we started thinking, well, like what else can we get out of this? You know, is it just lead time? Um, it, are there other things? So we started looking at um, capturing a quality metric. We started trying to get all the Dora metrics and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But the lead time picture we hadn't really talked about it with the teams. We did mention it, um, you know, kind of almost coincidentally when we were talking about WIP because people always want lower times, right? But Harner and I, in the background, we were like, man, these these blocks of time that we're taking to do these things are, are crazy. And when we started visualizing um, how long work was waiting for the next phase it got mm -hmm. even it got even more stark like the reality of the situation we were we were living in it turned out our regression times and and waiting for regression because of mm -hmm. the way that we structured the work that is where all of the time was spent waiting cued like waiting for that activity to happen yeah. and then spent where the work was done there was like days days mm -hmm. of things just 
piling up and piling up and piling up there. Mm -hmm. So in our personal conversations, we're looking at this and we're like, okay, well, this is, this is a little bit odd. And as we started looking at quality metrics, which we could also pull out of um, our ticketing system, it, it got even more obvious that <laughs> like there were, there were problems there, right? Like our, our defect, mm -hmm. you know, rate, our change failure rate as defined by Dora with the hot fixes and stuff like that, those rates were actually higher than um, we felt were acceptable. But yeah. what was interesting was that everyone on the team had been starting to get this feeling like our like our quality was starting to decrease. And you'd hear about mm -hmm. it kind of like not on the water coolers because, you know, COVID, but, um, you know, in some of the one-on-ones that I was in with developers, you'd hear like, oh, well, I'm starting to get worried about quality. And then here we had like, once we started looking at that particular data, here we had a measure of like how long this activity that was supposed to increase our quality was taking and how mm -hmm. not well we were doing at in, you know, increasing the quality of our, uh, of our deliverables. So that was the next thing. And that was probably the, the one where Harner and I, we were like, we have to, we have to tell our boss. Well, actually, before, before I said <laughs> that, I was like, we have to bury this. <laughs> like that was my immediate reaction. Like we cannot tell a single person about this. We just have to sh shutter the shop, pretend we didn't look at it, right? But Harner only let me suffer uh, that illusion for like a couple of seconds where he was like, well, let's just bring Bra like our, our boss, uh, yeah. wonderful man named Chris Browning. Let's bring Browning into the conversation and, and show him, show it to him. What was his it reaction? Happened, it happened just like that. I was like, hey, Browning, yeah. you got a couple minutes to hop into this meet? <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, sure. So we brought him in and we walked him through kind of the logic that we are, you know, of, of how we were collecting this stuff and, and what it meant. And and it was like, you know, he, he got it. He was like, yeah, yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that's probably where we should be focusing our efforts on our improvement, right? Yeah. Um, so. Did he know, like, uh, did you uh, explain it to him in layman terms or did, was he familiar with well, the actual, the lean and agile and these concepts, maybe even, you know, more as you talk more, it's like you're combining Scrum and Kanban, uh, or at least some of these lean, um, that are specific lean practices and looking at it holistically. Uh, was, uh, was your manager, because like essentially what I'm, getting at is a lot of times managers don't fully understand this stuff so as scrum masters how do you actually get them on the board um, to understand this stuff so it's either through just using common sense like this is where the things are or did you talk more and like hey look what happened here when our you know lead times increased or whatever right i think it was a combination of that i think like harner yeah. had been doing a great job like coaching um the the people in leadership about kind of the 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 devops and lean practices and like mm -hmm. what we could leverage here and there and, and like to solve problems but also the exercise we under undertook like months earlier where we got very simple and uh, concise definitions of like what is a defect right mm -hmm. like what is it what is a task like what are all these different type ticket types why do they matter What's our process? Why does that matter? I think that all made it common sense so that we could put the data in front of our boss. And mm -hmm. because he knew what those definitions were, because he understood what the data was, and because we had started to build confidence like by running these very small experiments and showing the results of those things, mm -hmm. it wasn't like, well, I don't trust the tool. I think this is wrong. It was like, okay, now we don't have to look for the problem anymore because we've just found it. You mm -hmm. know, like this was our principal constraint for lead time. It was um, a principal constraint for the defect, um, the defect metric, the quality metric that we were looking at too. So it was kind of like, okay, here's whether you want to improve quality or, or time to market or whatever, this is the thing we have to focus on because this is the activity that's supposed to, that's that's holding us up and that's supposed to catch uh, defects and, and isn't to the acceptable rate that um, we would we would like. All right, so as we all like agile development or, or iterative development or what, whatever is about feedback loops, right? It's about establishing mm -hmm. that um, and condensing those feedback loops 
right? So this regression activity, this regression suite that was taking 20, 20 hours over two days to run, that took place the last two days of a sprint, right? Is the, is, was really the, 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 the feedback loop for our developers to get that learning of, it, is my code going to cause mm -hmm. a regression? And, and so um, we wanted to, we could make the argument that the, that the principal constraint is it would be output of, of development, right? But we don't really know if the output of, from the development work center was, was good or bad until it passed, you know, these, these suite of tests. And so creating the, the capability to condense that feedback cycle so that it was, you know, within hours of a, of a, of a, of a code merge or you know, a, a check-in versus, you know, 10 days was um, even more validation for me that that was where we should be focusing our efforts, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's been proven that <laughs> to us, to Tom and I, it became very evident that that is a very challenging and com complicated and complex uh, constraint to solve for, right? It's, mm -hmm. it, had a, a, it has so many uh, pain relievers, right? If you're familiar with the value proposition canvas, right? uh, like if having this value proposition of, of optimizing our regression and our testing capabilities, optimizing you know this portion, had so many pain relievers, right? We could we could get work through faster. We could learn quicker, right? Um, the way we were we are treating our tests or, or thinking about you know, our test strategy was you know uh, test automation equals selenium equals cucumber, right? And mm -hmm. so trying to break that um, mentality and and rethink how we can test this functionality. Like, does it make sense to test all of this business logic at the in the UI layer. Can we can we mm -hmm. strip it down and speed it up so and and test that logic at the API layer or or via unit tests, right? And, and um, so that whole it's a very and, and then where do you start? You have a twenty mm -hmm. hour regression suite. Like which of those tests do you start with, right? Mm -hmm. And and so that's yeah. that's really where we're at where we're at now, right? We've we've got our our boots on and we're we're right in the thick of that right now. That conversation. And it's yeah. it's been it's it's phenomenal that the the progress that we've made and and the the feedback that we're able to get from these changes with this data now right and so Tom and I've been been monitoring each regression cycle since September since we started refactoring and, and optimizing this regression suite and at the time right it was about 20 hours um, and up until uh, last two sprints ago, right? We had, we had brought it down to about 16 hours. So we shaved four mm -hmm. hours off of it. Um, and we were just that four hours was like a huge relief to our, our QA engineers, right? That's a huge time savings for them. And then- um, Yeah, the, the uh, sorry, the anecdotal <laughs> evidence there at that time was like, you would start hearing the uh, QA engineers go, man, this, this last regression cycle went pretty smooth. You know, like this one, this yeah. one was pretty good. This one went pretty smooth. If they keep going smooth in the future, like this is going to be pretty, this is going to be all right, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and as we're refactoring these tests, right, we're bringing dev and QA and product together and rethinking like the, the intended functionality of, of the application for each of these tests, right? So what is this mm -hmm. cucumber test trying to do? And then we're going to, now that we all understand that we'll rewrite it. And so, so it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one swap from a, a quality perspective. We're actually seeing our, an increase in quality because we're testing things uh, in the right way, but also um, in the right, at the right time, uh, quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're confident that this, it's not the test that's broken, right? Because we're all aligned that this is, you know, it's being uh, uh, executed in the right way, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we know that if the test fails, it's a real failure. We should probably just think about that. Um, so, anyways, we've we cut it down in um, this last this last one. So we were at 13, 16 hours. We set a goal for Q2 of, of 13 hours. We wanted to get under 13 hours. This last regression suite ran in six and a half hours. Nice. So <laughs> we are we are just shattering. And, and that just, you could feel when we, when we started to talk about it, we don't know if it's an anomaly yet because we haven't got yeah. a, we, we don't know if it's going to continue, but the energy that came out of that conversation was, you know, infectious. It was, everybody's like, let's, let's try to get it down even more. Let's see, you know, let's see how far we can get this thing. And, and 
and and so we're we're off chasing that right now to see you know, what what can we do to maintain that um, and, and drive it down even more. Yeah. So maybe coming back to the manager again, uh, your boss, uh, can you talk about a little bit, uh, has he helped, in what ways has he helped you? What was that maybe just, uh, uh, what was his name, sorry? Uh, Chris Browning, he's, yeah. Chris Browning, yeah. Yeah, he's, um, how, in what ways has he helped? Well, like in a sense, like, uh, so a lot of times here's, the, without putting Chris, you know, um, uh, what I wanted to, as I said earlier, what I wanted to bring to attention is a lot of times uh, people like Chris, right, have no clue what's going on, right? And when I work with these people, if you build trust, they're like, Milan, you know, what I'm trying to do is figure out, you know, my role has changed. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can help the team without micromanaging, Right. So Chris might be, you know, exception <laughs> where he fully understand, but 98% of uh, these managers, in my opinion, don't have a holistic view, don't know how to support uh, Scrum Master. So I just wanted to bring that yep. to attention, just maybe to like, what did Chris do that was helpful? Maybe what, what are things that he didn't understand sure. that you guys coached and helped them? Because I think, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they have a manager or they're the manager, they might find value uh, in your example. Yeah, yeah. I um, so previous to any of this, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I had just gotten my team lead position. I was a software developer um, before that, uh, and a and I feel like a pretty productive one. Um, mm-hmm. And in those times, um, when Chris first came on board. One of the only ways, the only mechanisms we really had to figure out what we should be, what technical projects we should be working on next, like what tech debt, what problems we had with the code we wanted to work mm-hmm. on was to get everybody together in a room, all the devs and be like, hey, what's the worst problem in your yeah. opinion, right? <laughs> and so we would had, we had like, you know, a couple, couple page document where we would go through. And then once we got everyone together, we kind of did this weird voting thing and we, we prioritized that list and we got some of that work done. And um, it, it coincidentally, it was those improvements that we made w- that prompted Harner in that January parking garage conversation to mm-hmm. ask, you know, how have those changes, how have those fixes that you made, those things that all the developers really believed were the worst problems that we solved in, in 2019, how did those meaningfully contribute or change um, our ability to deliver software? So, so back then, that's the only mechanism we had. Once we started getting people to buy into the data, once we got good, reliable data, mm-hmm. once we were made aware of it, the conversation completely shifted, right? We didn't have to search for the problems anymore. When we focused on delivery capabilities, we could look at the data for our delivery capabilities and we could see the problem. You could see where the bottlenecks are and then yeah. point them rather than guess. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's invaluable. Like, it, it, like it, everything became visible before the only thing you had was a gut feeling. I feel mm-hmm. like this, I feel like that. And, and the only time that that was surfaced was in retro, right? Mm-hmm. QA would be like, Oh yeah, this this regression really sucked. Or the you know developers would be like, yeah, these tickets over here they really sucked, and we dig into why. But we didn't really. We would have that retro conversation, and then like two weeks later, everybody forgot about the previous retro, and maybe we we're complaining about some of the same things, or maybe it was like four or five weeks later where the problem stuck up again, you know. Mm-hmm. And and so there wasn't that consistent holistic view with that historicity or that historical nature where you could go back and say like, well, here's been our problem all along. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very like, set it, try to fix something, forget it. And maybe if the problem comes back up, you didn't even remember that you tried to solve that before. Whereas now it's like, here's the data, you know, what is the data telling us? Let's interrogate that. And, And specifically to Chris's engagement, right? We, we had built, we, we always, he always trusted us, right? But we had helped to build his trust in the process, in this information um, and what it could do. And he was really the advocate for this kind of outward, right? He was mm-hmm. kind of the, the uh, conduit to uh, our, you know, up the chain, up our leadership chain, and as well as the business partners, right? Um, mm-hmm. Our organizational structure is, is a little unique. So uh, our product and technology and QA 
kind of report up through different uh, a, a different uh, hierarchy. And so he was kind of, the, again, the conduit that kind of helped to bring the, the leadership uh, channels together and, and kind of be the voice of, of what we were doing. So he's helped to get these things, uh, these initiatives, uh, these ideas kind of uh, embedded into some of our OKRs um, mm -hmm. and some of our uh, the, the um, kind of the, the, the discussions that happen at that level. So he's really been that, that outward voice out, outside of kind of our organizational bubble, which has been really helpful um, to, to help grow that. Um, you know, uh, we're starting to see some of the, the ripple effects and other teams showing interest in some of these things, um, which has been really Really helpful. Yeah. So maybe that, that's what we can discuss as a last topic. Like, you know, this is great across a couple of teams, but how do you, you publicly trade a company? How do you get, you know, uh, others involved and how do you get, cause that's the, that's the tough part, right? In a sense, like right. uh, it, it's, you can't just tell them do what we did in a sense. Right. But to a point, right. All we were doing is, is leveraging kind of industry proven patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Visualize your value stream, right? Uh, understand that your types of work, right? Uh, be data driven, right? these, these really uh, high level things. And so those, while each value stream is, is inherently kind of unique and special, Right. The the concept of visualizing your value stream end to end is, is something that should be applied, uh, at least in my opinion, across any product or service. It is. But right. like you could you can say, like you could have another Andrew and Tom that, for instance, you know, one of the things that I noticed, you know, on both, for both of you, you you know, Tom has a, a technical background. I know, Andrew, you don't as far as I know, uh, but you understand this stuff. Right. So you, you can talk to developers, you, you know, a lot of Scrum Masters don't fully understand that. And that's not their, you know, uh, 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 area that they're comfortable with. So they avoid it. So I think that's one thing. So you could say, imagine like that you don't have the technical background, you don't have this, and then you're saying do value stream mapping and you're actually uh, enforcing people to do it. You're going to have a different result than what you guys did. So a lot of this comes to right. your leadership, your understanding when to push, when not to push. And that, that's the hard part to scale. The practices itself, like value stream mapping, like capturing the data, that they can copy that, but it's the soft skills. It's all of the things that you did and, and that you keep navigating. That, that's what's harder to scale, right? Because it, it, it's it, it's the <laughs> it's the right. people side of things. I think it has to come from right a, a why to your to your point. Yeah. You, you, the word you used is uh, enforce, right? If if it's a, if it's a top-down enforcement of you, you, you must do value stream mapping and you must rethink everything. Um, I think you're, you, there's gonna be a natural resistance to that, right? I think uh, throughout this process, you know, I was kind of, you know, poking and, and, and prodding and pushing Tom and others um, to help find what that, what that trigger was, what the why was gonna be, mm -hmm. right? And, and each, each challenge, uh, each you know, uh, kind of chapter in this book, this story that we're telling, uh, we've identified another why, another reason why we should be continuing to drive forward. And uh, I think that's important, right, to other areas. So there's other areas that we've partnered with and it's, it's predictability, right? That's their why, mm -hmm. like they wanna be more predictable. They wanna understand why they're, they're missing deadlines, right? That's a, that's a great you know, foot in the door of, hey, well, if we map out our value stream, we can kind of see where things are getting hung up and we can mm -hmm. see why we're not predictable. We can see why we're missing our deadlines, right? There's so understanding and, and trying to, uh, I guess the right word is, is creating empathy, establishing empathy with your customers. And also, you know, as, as coaches or as, you know, change leaders, you know, we, we have to establish empathy with, with the kind of internal business partners that we're partnering with to, to see like what's, what's going to get them to, to join the guy on the hill, right? So mm -hmm. I'm out there dancing. I'm out there. I could be out there dancing for a while, but like, you know, um, Tom felt bad for me dancing alone. So that was his why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, but, I think I think that you're you're onto something there. Like, what? 
we're still very much in this, right? So it's not like mm -hmm. this is a solved problem for us. The, what we've tried to do is at every opportunity that we have something to share with somebody, we, we try to share it and be open and transparent. One of um, Harner's favorite sayings, or at least the one that he tells me most often, um, is that we need to be bold and we need to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? Like not everything in this journey has been rosy or sunny, but every time we've had a success, we want to talk about not just the success and how we got there, but also the, the pain points along the way. We, mm -hmm. We've we've had audiences with, um, you know, our boss's boss and, and his peers. Um, we've taken opportunities that we have with like newsletters to try to push various pieces of this thing. Like when we first got our value stream mapped um, mm -hmm. and, and when we brought everybody in to like agree on that, the next newsletter, you know, we sent, we tried to send out like, oh yeah, we, we just completed this exercise. And one of the questions that came back is like, what's a value stream map? You know, like, <laughs> why is that important? Can you give us some background there? So we've tried to leverage every tool at our disposal, talks, um, one-on-ones, uh, conversations with our boss, like trying, trying to talk to the larger group of leadership on our project because everybody has connections you know everywhere it, it's a it's a corporate company but mm -hmm. it's a pretty small corporate company and people know each other and, and so we're trying to leverage all those relationships as well and just kind of tell our story tell tell mm -hmm. the story over and over and over again just like we got the teams to kind of buy in and be involved just like we got our boss browning to buy in and be involved um that's what we're we're trying to do now um and have seen some people get interested in that and we're see, working with now various people throughout the organization just as like a small community of practice mm -hmm. um, but trying to like figure out where the problems are what's next and how we can help the kind of other value streams at our company um, start to see some progress like what we've seen progress mm -hmm. it's not even going to be the same journey in a lot of cases right mm -hmm. but um that's so is that more coaching? Like, is, you know, does it go beyond communities of practice? Do you guys actually coach other uh, Scrum Masters and other people outside of your value stream? Yeah. No. We've got a, uh, a network of, of change agents that we're kind of growing. Um, mm -hmm. our, our company uses uh, G Suite, and so we've got our avatars in Slack. And so uh, we've chosen... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're all Ninja Turtles. Right? So we've got different uh, ninjas. We've got a master splinter. We've got, you know, um, and so we can start to see kind of, uh, uh, you know, who's out there, who's kind of working yeah. together and, and helping to grow that, that kind of uh, just putting ideas out there, getting people to think. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I firmly believe it, it, it takes, takes a need, right? One of the uh, two most, uh, uh, it, important works, uh, literature works in, in our business, right? I think is uh, the goal and the Phoenix Project, right? Mm -hmm. And the main characters in both of those, Alex and Bill, right? Their their company or, or their their plant, or, you know, is on the brink of closing, mm -hmm. right? They, they they have a need, right? So it was kind of frustrating. Sense of urgency, me. right? It, yeah, so to speak. And so, how do we create that sense of urgency or that sense of need? So that it becomes, you know, a, a pull instead of a push of this mm -hmm. information. Um, you know, I, early I got so frustrated, like, why aren't they? Why don't you understand? This is so logical. Like, why wouldn't you want to do this? But you know, it's you know, you give them these books, but then, you know, the reality is, is like those characters, they they had a need, right? They were in a position mm -hmm. of, of of influence and of change. They could, they could help really kind of uh, turn things around, and and that coupled with you know, the, the, the sense of urgency that they felt from their plant closing or, you know, their team being shut down was, mm -hmm. was really what drove them um, to help um, pull that in. And it's, it's hard to, it's hard to establish that urgency or need when it seems like it's just butterflies and rainbows. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but you really never know when that, that next thundercloud's rolling in. Right. I mean, COVID hit, you know, nobody saw that coming and that probably mm -hmm. established a sense of urgency for a lot of different companies um so yeah what I, I don't know i think it's been about the data too like there's mm -hmm. when we were talking about 
things with velocity and story points there's that age old problem mm-hmm. of like how do you <laughs> how do you compare apples and oranges how do you compare this team to that team or whatever mm-hmm. for whatever the reason is behind that desire it's it's not really possible but when we started talking about you know we had like a little internal technology talk about what we'd done and what we were measuring um and that five or ten minute spot uh that that harner presented that information it was very clear and logical to people and and there were a lot of like bites uh, after that like a lot of people reaching out and and getting really you know excited Mm -hmm. by what we were saying and and wondering how they could leverage that in their part of the organization too Mm -hmm. and really it's been the data that's been so you know to use a maybe an inappropriate term but seductive like those meetings that we had like every day when we were trying to just understand the data, it, it made me feel like I knew more about the project I was working on than, than anyone else. It made me feel like I knew more about it than and I ever had before. As we've gone from like data unaware to data aware, and now I'm probably having a little bit of a data affair, if that's... <laughs> <laughs> It's probably silly, but uh, uh, no, I mean, and I, you know, as you uh, both uh, what you and Andrew uh, said just uh, here in the last couple of minutes, it reminded me of something that, you know, as I'm listening to you guys, uh, you're naturally, uh, I can tell that like naturally you understand people, right? And if I had to guess, at least I work with Andrew, so I know like, you know, his people skills and his understanding. Tom, I never work with you, um, so I don't know that, but if I had to guess, right? You, you, uh, you don't fully understand psychology, but you understand people, right? And I think maybe just to bring it uh, to, to full circle here, because I think we've discussed a lot of different things here. And uh, it's like a lot of times scrum masters don't fully understand the people, the culture and psychology of what, like, how do you create that sense of urgency? Like what, what sense of urgency for one person versus another? And it, this is maybe just a message to, you know, aspiring coaches and uh, uh, scrum masters out there. I didn't fully uh, understand things till I started diving into psychology, understanding the people. And once I started reading, like some of the things that you do naturally, that you just, it's your gut feeling. Once you actually get good at understanding people and how people think, what motivates them, then you can actually, similar with the data, <laughs> then you can start doing and influencing more if you know what's going on rather than just and holding on to your gut feeling. So um, so that's what, as you guys were talking, I think data is important, understanding both lean and agile or, you know, DevOps, <laughs> that's the latest, but understanding the whole systemic view, um, using the quality data, having the right tools. But I, I would say a lot of people also forget about the people side of things. Hmm. And uh, that's something at least that I've seen in the Agile community that, you know, there's more and more uh, of need to understand that. But uh, yeah. so. But this yeah, is for, we... this is for them. This is for all mm-hmm. of us, right? This isn't, mm-hmm. this isn't about, well, it's about bottom lines and all that other stuff too. But I think the literature and the studies have shown over and over and over again, that if, if you treat your line workers well, if you make mm-hmm. their lives better, your company will see success, right? And that's what it's always been about for us. It's been about making our lives better through making our coworkers' lives better, through making our our processes better, uh, through delivering a better product and making our company better. 